what brings people into opposition with God? You know, there are people, they were in the church. You've met them. All of a sudden, they're opposing the very thing they used to believe in. These people are opposed to Jesus as being the Messiah because he doesn't fit the bill of their expectation. It wasn't bearing fruit. And so what is to be done of it? Was it to, to be given another season for it to, to be let to bear fruit? Mm. The, the Jewish leaders, the priests, the scribes, these were the same people who were you know, there while the selling and the buying was going on in the temple. And now that Jesus came and threw these people out of the temple and said that this house shall not be used in such a way, mm. they come back to him and they ask him the question, who said you could do that? Mm. Who said you could chase us out of the temple? Who gave you authority over us? These people did not necessarily read the scripture to seek God, but to be knowledgeable so that they can have more controversies. Or what's the word? Um, you know, the arguments of who's, who, who knows what, mm. I'm, I'm better than you, and, mm. you know, trying to, to, to beat on your knowledge, mm. but not seeking Christ. How is it that I can love somebody else as myself? Mm. Is, is it something that is possible? Is it something that we can practice as Christians? Mm. Happy Sabbath uh, and good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you're joining us from. And welcome to our Sabbath school this morning. It's been a great week. It's been a camp meeting season and I want to say a special thank you to my, to my colleague uh, Ramona who's been handling the camp meeting season while this group of panelists was out serving the Lord in different camp meetings. But it's good to be back. So thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Masio Dora. I will be your moderator this morning and I'd like to have my panelists introduce themselves before we go into prayer and begin our lesson. So shall I start with you, Seraphine? Okay. My name is Seraphine Okemwa. Happy Sabbath and we are glad you've joined us. Amen. Good morning. Uh, happy Sabbath. Um, happy to be part of this panel today. <laughs> I'm Rumwana Pio and I'll be taking us through Tuesday, the abomination of desolation. Welcome. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. We want to thank the Lord this morning for granting us an opportunity to come here and learn from him as we prepare for his coming. My name is Jared Manyara. I'm a member of this church. Amen, Amen, Elder. And online, we've got... Shall we start with you, Elder Chief? Uh, thank you very much, Blessed Sabbath. Uh, I'm called uh, Chief Andrew. We'll be joining us in today's study. Okay. Amen. And Saya? Hey, hi, everyone. My name is Saya Jackson, and I am honored to be um, with you all. And thank you very much. It's great to have you all. I'll ask Ramona to pray for us as we begin our lesson. Okay, let's pray. Uh, God in our Father, we thank you for this time. We have gathered here to study your word. We pray, Lord, that you may teach us, uh, help us to unlearn what we think we know and teach us afresh. Pour your Holy Spirit in abundance, Lord, unto us. Should there be any sin that we have committed that is standing between us and seeing you clearly, please forgive us and make us whole again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ramona. This week, our lesson is the last days. It is very interesting that this now we've come very close to Mark. Actually, we're having uh, our lesson this week is pretty much uh, based on Mark chapter 12 towards the end and Mark chapter 13. The one chapter that actually is a complementary chapter of uh, Matthew chapter 24, which is very known uh, by most people about the, uh, the last days uh, and Jesus talking to his disciples towards what the last days would look like. And then and Luke chapter 21. So Mark chapter thir uh, 13 basically looks at, we, we will see Mark, uh, Mark talking about, you know, uh, predicting the destruction of the beautiful temple of Jerusalem. I'm sure the disciples just could not conjure it in their minds that it was possible for that beautiful temple to be destroyed. But here is Jesus predicting that that would happen. We also look at the signs of the end times and the end of age. We look at the great tribulation. We look at the coming of the Son of Man and what does that mean and what are the promises that come from there. And that is where we will end from our lesson for today to be able then to go into the next lesson. So the last days, 
what was Jesus talking about with his disciples? And the lesson starts with us with a brief story that's coming from, uh, from, from Mark chapter 12. And in this story, you would imagine, it, it feels like a by the way into the lesson. You know, when we, we think Jesus is in the temple and, and this story, we'll get to hear what's happening with this widow and the giving of her, her what she gives unto the Lord. We then look at uh, the different prophecies. And Mark, Mark 13, uh, our contributor to the, our author of the lesson says that what Mark 13 makes quite clear is that the prophecy goes from the time of the prophet to Jesus to the time of the end and his second coming. And so this lesson's week, basically looking at the, the different, the message that Jesus wanted his disciples to know when Almost always, as we have looked at the story of Mark, we've seen when the, the disciples would ask a question and Jesus would patiently explain the, the answers to his disciples. And in this, he's talking to them about the future. He's talking to them a future that would have been very difficult for them to understand, but that which he patiently and, uh, explains to them to help them understand where he was going. We have been talking about who Jesus is and where he's going to the cross, but in this case, he's actually talking to them beyond the cross. So let's see what his teachings are and the understanding the disciples that we'll have in the teachings of this week. So Ramona, I want a story. Elder Manyara, I want to come to you. As we look at the end of Mark chapter 12, and we see a story here of a widow and her offering. And I'd like you to take, to take us through what, why is this story significant? And why did Jesus have to teach his disciples based on this particular widow? Elder. Thank you very much, Sister Masi. Um, I was looking at this story and I find it very interesting. We are talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And this story is setting is right in the temple. And this magnificent temple that was built. And uh, when uh, you look at it, uh, the lesson writer was saying that the materials that were used to build it were amazing. Stones were weighing hundreds of tons. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you could ask yourself, how were they carrying them? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Probably the technology of that time. It was remodeled and expanded. So you can imagine how beautiful it was. Now, Jesus was in the temple. Mm -hmm. And in the temple, there were 13 chests mm -hmm. located in the court of women near the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, at least now we can see why the, the issue of the ladies coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And Jesus, as the Bible says, he was sitting opposed the treasury. And so, as people put money into the treasury, and I, I think the way they were doing it must have caught his attention. And he starts with the many, <laughs> the many people. Doesn't start with the widow, but the many people who were rich. That's how the lesson describes them. And they put in much. Ideally, in a church setting, when we see much money coming in, we are so glad the church can be able to meet it is expenditure uh, responsibilities it can do mission and we expect more money and we are so glad with that but jesus was concerned the way they were giving now comes the widow and she puts in two mites mm -hmm. and the lesson writer was saying that this was equivalent to a day's wage. You can imagine, you work the whole day and you take everything to the temple. What do you remain with for food? Mm -hmm. What do you remain with for other needs? So, you can see the greater sacrifice that this lady did. She gave all. And she did mind 
she was not bothered. And this struck Jesus. And he said to his disciples that assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all these who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she gave out out of her poverty. Put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. You can imagine someone not minding about herself, mm -hmm. but minding about what she's giving to the Lord mm -hmm. and whom she's giving to. Mm -hmm. You can imagine the kind of faith that she had. And this many that Jesus describes as putting in much, mm -hmm. they were many with much. That's true. And probably... You could imagine that what they gave it could be a very small fraction, probably 1%. They could have given millions, but that's a small fraction of what they were giving, uh, of what they had. But this lady gives 100% of what she had and remained with nothing. And this is what moved Jesus. And Jesus said that she had put in more than all the others who had given. Amen. Because it is all about the heart that gave. She didn't withhold anything from the Lord. Amen. She just put all of it and knew that something could happen. Amen. I've come across, there was a friend of mine who told me one time, they were in Nairobi Central Church when they were in school. And... Uh, the pastor appealed to the church members to give all that they had for a certain cause. This friend of mine and uh, his friends, they had failed to take them to town. And uh, they really struggled. <laughs> but after much consideration, they gave all. Um, I may not have the time, but I want to say that that day God did a big miracle for them. Amen. And you can see that this lady or this widow who was poor gave all because she trusted in God. Amen. There is something else that was brought out in the lesson about sometimes about how we manage resources mm -hmm. in the church. Sometimes leaders can mismanage the resources. Mm -hmm. It has not begun now. Mm -hmm. It was there even in the time of Jesus. Sometimes when some of us feel like now, how can I give resources to be what? Mismanaged. Mm -hmm. But Jesus did not tell the people not to take their money to the treasury. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have given out of your heart it doesn't mean that if resources were mismanaged, God will not punish you. Uh, go, 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 sorry, God will not bless you. He will bless you because he looks at the heart that gave. If there are those who mismanage, it is upon them. And it is an encouragement I found myself, and probably I'm sure many of us uh, find that encouragement that we do our bit, just like the widow did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elda. And, and that is so true because I know because as a church, you know, and really um, it's, it's very easy even as a government, as, as citizens of this country where you feel that your taxes are being mis mismanaged and it hurts. It hurts. So you can imagine if you're feeling like my taxes are being mismanaged and my tithe is being mismanaged, there's a temptation for us to think that, you know what? What if I don't give? Or what if I give to my village, church, Ramona? And I want to come to you because that tends to happen when we say, I don't like what's happening in the churches in Nairobi. I'm going to be giving my, my tithe and offering to my church in the village. Mm. But what does this story teach us? Picking up from where Elder has stopped, mm. what does this story teach us about the importance of being faithful when we give to God's work? Um, I know the first the commandment to giving, it's been there, but it is expressively mentioned in 
Malachi 3.10, where God says, um, Bring all tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me, me in this. Uh, it's a whole verse. It talks about the blessings and everything. And then when you move to the book of Second Corinthians, chapter 9, um, and then verse 7, it says that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. That's like the last part. So let each one give as he purposes mm -hmm. in his heart, mm -hmm. not grudgingly mm -hmm. or of necessity, you know, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So Jesus sitting at the temple and just observing like the attitude towards the giving. You know, these people are coming to give and maybe I have seen mercy has given this much. So I also want to outdo mm -hmm. mercy. Mm -hmm. So it stops becoming a uh, uh, relationship between them and God, mm -hmm. but some sort of competition, you mm -hmm. see? But this woman is having this uh, money in, in her hand and she's coming to give with all her heart, mm -hmm. sacrificial giving, mm -hmm. you know. Our elder is telling us that it is a day's wage. So I'm just here thinking, she prayed for this job. She has gotten the job. She has gotten this money. And then again, she's taking it to God. Does it even sound logic, surely? Because she doesn't even seem to understand where she'll get her next meal. She's just giving it to God. You know, Jesus says that if you, will, if you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandment and that is all for this lady that she wants to reciprocate you know she's giving out of love mm -hmm. and that comes to us i know last week when we were having the lesson one of us um ted if you remember him he, on the panel he told us that Sometimes we are just giving the tithes and mm. offerings, but we haven't given yeah. our hearts mm. to God. We are holding some part of us. Mm. This woman is giving everything she has. She's like, I'm surrendering everything, everything. Mm. And that is what we are called to do. That is the importance of being faithful with Amen. everything that we have. We are faithful with our tithes and offerings, which is essentially money, mm -hmm. but also our talent. So such that you won't give out your tithes and offerings, mm -hmm. but you don't want to participate in church activities. Like, you are a very good teacher of children, <laughs> but you don't want to say, I've given my tithes and offerings, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me, it's really about the attitude we are giving and are we giving all or why are we giving? What is our purpose of giving? Are we giving in response to God's love and faithfulness in our lives? Or are we just giving because it's written in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. What is my attitude and why am I giving? Amen. Very, very profound. Let me come to you, Elder Chief. As, the, as, as Jesus moves from the temple, so him and his disciples move from the temple, but he is looking at this temple <laughs> and he's predicting, you know, when he tells his disciples that, um, and that is in Mark chapter 13, verse 1, then he went out of the temple uh, and one of his disciples says to him, you know, in exclamation, teacher, what manner of stones and buildings are here? As in, he is so impressed with this temple. I, th I hear people who have seen, uh, who's, who's been, in, is it in, in Israel? They actually, and this is actually the, it, it's, this is the, what? It's not even the, um, it, it doesn't even look like the temple looked then, yet they still say it's a very beautiful temple. So Elder Chief, when Jesus looks at this temple and he says, do you see these great buildings? Not a single stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. If this was you and Jesus was saying this to you after you're looking at this temple and you're so in awe of what a beautiful temple it is, why would Jesus say this and what was he talking about? Thank you very much. Um, when, when, when you look at the temple, the temple is, 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 is something else. The, the, the temple that Herod uh, refurbished afterwards mm. is, is not like the actual temple that was there, but... Um, I, I mean, going into a study of this, I got to understand that the temple actually was magnificent. It was, it, it was an, edifice, an edifice to behold. You look at it, and there's a sense of pride. When, when you read that text, it goes very quickly when you just say, I'll see what manner of stones are things. I, I don't think you get the gist of it when you read it like that. Mm -hmm. you, you, you must read it with uh, some... Uh, Sanctimonious pride that these people <laughs> had. They were feeling a bit religious mm. and, and trying to say, do, do, do you just see what we've put up mm. for the Lord? 
And, and, and this, is, this is a common thing that we see so many people coming up with it. Uh, people will, will even say, no, no, I'm, I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying <laughs> we, we've given to the Lord. In fact, seeing this coming immediately after the humble mm. widow, I, I don't run by words in the Bible. I, I, I like uh, breaking them down and looking at what it is. The widow gave very little. Jesus talked about it as being prominent. Mm. But the disciples are trying to talk about, look at the serious things we've done for the Lord. Mm. And, and, and so don't miss that point because it is a joining point. They, they, they are trying to brag about the serious things that have been done to the Lord. And then Jesus is, is trying to make it clear. Listen, uh, the, there is something greater that we need to be putting a lot of emphasis on. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, for the ubiquitous uh, recordings, I will be found repeating myself saying that we are so much into brick and mortar evangelism say that we, we put up nice temples mm. at the expense of uh, the souls, at the expense of people getting ready. And that's why Jesus now goes ahead to say, you see these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Mm. He says, look, look at these buildings. I want to tell you, these buildings, and by the way, somebody should not leave this discussion thinking that we are saying, okay, now let's make for God makeshift uh, <laughs> structure because we are heading for heaven soon. Let's just put up a makeshift structure. No, God's structures must be done properly. But He wants us to understand we are not doing it for pride. When you are doing it for the Lord, let us do it. It's worship. That's why the giving is out of worship. And I think uh, Sister Ramona has really put it well there. And since and they sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple. Peter and James and Andrew asked him privately. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, you see, uh, th th this is one interesting place. I've, I've noticed Andrew for the first time has joined the top three. Always it's Peter, John, and James. But here now you have even Andrew coming in. And, and everyone is seemingly interested in this issue about the temple. And Jesus answers mm -hmm. and says, and then they ask Jesus, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the signs when all these things shall be fulfilled? Mm -hmm. Then when Jesus is answering, he says, let no man deceive you. And, and you're going to see that here, Jesus is going to give two two-point explanation. And this story is also found in, in the book of Luke and in the book of uh, Matthew. And, and you're going to see that when Jesus is responding to this, he does it in two parts. He explains the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and comes also to explain the signs of his coming. <laughs> and so when you look at these two, uh, Jesus does it. And uh, interestingly, in the book of Mark, he doesn't spend a lot of time in the destruction of Jerusalem. <laughs> he puts more emphasis on the signs of his coming. <laughs> And, and, and I think this um, captured my attention when he doesn't put so much emphasis. He, he tells them of challenges that they will say. He says, and many shall deceive you. People shall come in my name and say, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. And, and I think we're going to emphasize on this later. Now it begins talking about wars and rumors of wars. Be you not troubled for such things must needs be, but the end shall not come. Nations shall rise against nation. And, and, and you see when when he talks about these signs, one thing should come out clearly. He is even explaining to the disciples the challenges that they are going to face. Mm -hmm. He's saying, listen, don't be obsessed about the structures. There are certain things that are going to happen even to you. Mm -hmm. And then look at the challenges. He says, take it for yourself. What's the time? For they shall deliver you up to councils. In the synagogues, you shall be beaten. You shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Mm -hmm. The gospel must first be published among all nations. You see, when it says no stone on another, I, I want us to understand that J Jesus is not just talking about Jerusalem and wanting us to focus on the destruction in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But it brings in other things. When the tribulations come, are you able to focus on your salvation? Are you able to stand and testify? He says, 
these things are going to happen. You're going to be brought up before councils. You will be needed to testify. And, and I think, let's make this practical. Let's have it to apply even to us because these are the signs of the end. We are not just going to complain that, you, you, you know, uh, we are not being allowed to work on servers, we are having challenges. Oh, listen to this. These are signs of the end times. Mm. We, we, we are being called. When you are going through trials as a child of God, you must know that this is part of the signs of the end time. Signs of the end time. I've had people ask so many times that, uh, but how can Jesus come and yet we have not seen? People are looking for serious things. Mm. People are not looking for, you, you see, there are several signs of the end times. Why are you focused on the political ones? Why are you not worried about the ones that are focusing on the spiritual? When you say that this gospel must first be published among all nations. And that is why one of the reasons we have even the online uh, discussion is for us to be able to get this gospel, make as many people as possible aware of this. And it says, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand of what you shall speak. Neither do you premeditate for whatsoever shall be given to you in that hour. Shall speak, for it shall not be you that shall speak, but the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I, I, I see some emphasis here. You need to have an acquaintance with the Holy Ghost before the time when the trouble shall come. If, if, if you are able to be in touch with the Holy Ghost beforehand, when you will be brought to the castles, because these are the signs that you're going to face. Mm. Even the time when we were saying that, listen, there will be a time of, of fleeing Jerusalem. When Jesus is saying that, he, he, he is really making it clear that when the time shall come, when no stone shall be left upon another, when the Titus will come, the Romans will come, when that time will come, there are those who will be the elect who will be able to stand. So for me, in the multitudes, I, I, I see just trying to link this from where we started with a woman who was sacrificially giving. Uh, listen, God rewards sacrificial giving. And God just, just doesn't want us to give sacrificially and put good things for him. He wants that when we are spending time putting up good edifices for him, we must also spend time making sure that the temple of the Holy Ghost is properly done. Because in the last days, that is one thing that we will need to stand. Amen. Amen, Elder. That is so powerful. And what I like about uh, verse 13 is when it says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And we want to thank God because in spite of all that, there is hope that, the, that there's still hope. I want to come to you, Ramona, for us to look at the ab abomination of desolation. You know, that sounds like a really big word. Yeah. And it is a big word, and it will be good for us to see. And what I see in this is a Jesus who picks up prophecies, mm. which means every time I hear people saying that the Old Testament has mm -hmm. been done away with and we're living in the, in the times of grace and the, the New Testament is what applies, mm. take us through so that then we can see that if Jesus looked back at the prophecies that had been spoken by mm. Daniel, and he speaks to them now that these prophecies still apply to us. Amen. Uh, you know, the first thing I note is um, when, or something I've learned doing this lesson is when we, because when you study, it's you in your house, you mean my house, you know, wherever. Mm. But when we come here and we pray, the Holy Spirit works in a way that he unites our of thoughts. Because I think was talking about what I wanted to say before I started the, my part, uh, giving sacrificially. Like that is the first lesson we are learning on Sunday, giving ourselves sacrificially. Why? And this is why the why comes here, the abomination of desolation mm -hmm. it is not an easy thing again you know when we've been studying this lesson we've noticed that the the disciples ask jesus very things that are very trivial so to speak and i think that is what we do we focus on the very trivial matters and we leave the greater things mm -hmm. outside we don't mm -hmm. ask the lord about the greater things but jesus is understanding these people just like he understands us and he wants to explain to us what does it mean the abomination of what desolation mark 13 11 verse 
14 all the way to 18, but I'll just focus on some very two verses. Um, I'll focus on 14 and 15. And it says, and so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing where it ought not, in Matthew 24, 15, it says, standing in the holy places, mm -hmm. let the reader understand, let then, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Mm -hmm. Let him who is in the housetop not go down in that, into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. By 16, 17, 18, and all the way to 19, Jesus is just giving them warnings and warnings. And some place he says, I hope it, is, it does not find you on Sabbath. So the question that we are asking, or rather when Jesus is referring to this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, like Mercy says again, there are people who keep saying that, you know what, uh, we are in the new dispensation where we read the New Testament <laughs> only. But this is Jesus making reference to, Matthew, to Daniel 9. And we know before Daniel gets this prophecy, he has, he has actually to fast and pray. And this comes in verse 26 and 27 of Daniel. It says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself and for the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured is poured out on the desolate uh today at least we are not doing the mathematics of 62 weeks <laughs> <laughs> we are just we just want to understand who is the anointed and who is this prince to do what to come verse 24 and 27 of daniel makes it very clear to us that the anointed one the one who is to come is what is is jesus christ because he's not coming for himself but for us and that already happened Jesus came died for our sins and that is why we can uh, boldly approach the throne of grace the second question that we are asking is who is the prince who is to do what to come uh, this prince that is to come and to destroy the temple in Jerusalem Jerusalem the magnificent uh, temple and when i was looking at this temple i'm just imagining the very many things that we look at and we're like hey this one cannot be destroyed and then you're told it's going to be destroyed and it hurts you it saddens you you know it is through this um uh it is through the romans or the general roman general titus he came and when we are talking of Daniel 26 or 27, this is actually who, or rather the uh, prophecy is, really referring to. And then there's also the abomination of de desolation that Jesus is making reference to, or what is Daniel really talking about. There have been many theories, scholars have tried to decipher what is really this, but the truth, or rather the abomination that Jesus is likely referring to, is how the Roman uh, Empire comes and plants very abominable things in mm. the temple of Jerusalem. Mm. Tiff has just told us that we need to look at the temple, and the temple here is referenced to us ourselves. Mm. Are we planting abominable things within mm. us? Are we letting the Holy Spirit, are we having an acquaintance, a relationship that is correct to the Holy Spirit? Or are we are just living desolate? We are just uh, living as if the days are not happening. You know, my grandmother was told Jesus is coming soon. He never came. So you're just living carelessly as a Christian. Are you taking care of, your, of the temple of the Lord? Mm -hmm. The abomination of desolation is really just, we've moved from the physical temple to us, us. Who are the temple of Christ? Mm -hmm. So are we taking care of it? That's the question I'll leave with us. Amen. That is so powerful, Ramona. Sire, Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem. 
and it was with such exactness. So how can we learn to trust him in other Bible predictions? How, how can you tell somebody who may not believe the faith that you do, but how do you help them understand that if he could predict it so exact that you can trust him in other areas of the Bible? In my, in my day-to-day life, I, I work a lot with um, individuals trying to get their CV and resumes together. And one guiding principle we use in resumes is you're hired not for what you can do, but you're hired for what you got done. So basically what your resume says is it's a history of everything you got done, and that's what persuades your next would-be employer to hire you based on your track record. Mm -hmm. So in a similar sense, when you're in the, quote-unquote, the marketplace of gods or the marketplace of ideas, choosing which one to trust, which ones not to distrust, Jesus presents before you a very elaborate resume in which he has not just this prediction about the destruction of Jerusalem, which mm-hmm. happened with pinpoint accuracy, mm-hmm. but there's an entire litany of prophecies that um, he gave, whether it was through Daniel or through Isaiah or through Jeremiah or all the other prophets that have also been able to happen as was predicted. Mm-hmm. And which tells you not only does he have ability, he also follows through, he executes um, as he did. And then attendant to that is the why. God is not just um, in the business. And when Ramona was explaining it, this was accurate. He said he not only predicted the fall of Jerusalem, but he also spoke to the contingencies that need to be in place. He said, hey, pray that this doesn't happen in the winter. Pray that this doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Because he was more concerned, not that he is accurate on the prophecy, but mm-hmm. what the implication for the hearers would be. So he's not sadistic. He, mm-hmm. he, he says what is coming, mm-hmm. and then he tells the people what they need to do in, in light of that. Now, when you take these two components of his resume, um, one, the ability to accurately predict the future, mm-hmm. and B, the love to help people prepare well for that predicted future, and that consistently these two things have come together when you're looking for someone you can reliably place the project called your life and your present and your eternity on, then the resume of Christ rises above any mm. other resume that is in the marketplace of ideas. Amen. Wow. Seraphine, as part of that, you know, looking at that, then that predictions of exactness. Mark chapter 13, 19 says that if for in those days there will be tribulation such as never has not been seen since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, nor shall ever be. So he's predicted. And anytime we hear about the great tribulation, human beings, we are filled with fear. But I want us to, you to take us through what was this that Jesus was talking about? And is there hope even in that prediction? Amen. The great tribulation. Reading from the book of Mark chapter 13, from verse 19, I'll read through 23. It says, For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. Mm. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Amen. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, and lo, here is, he is here, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise mm. and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, if even, the even the very elect. Mm. But take ye heed, Behold, I have foretold you Mm. all these things. The English man once said, to be forewarned, it is to be forearmed. Actually, Jesus Christ here initially tells them of what to expect before the temple is brought down. Because this was going to be monumental for them. And even it was going to shake 
the faith of some of them. But in verse 19, it is not the destruction of Jerusalem he's referring to per se. Why? Because it is a long period, number one. And number two, we know that after the destruction of Jerusalem, there have been other persecutions that have actually been greater than that. So which persecution is this we are talking about? It is the persecution that we find in the book of Daniel chapter 7 mm -hmm. from verse 23 to 27, reading through, and again it's echoed in Revelation chapter 12, where we see the people of God persecuted for 1,260 days, which is essentially um, in Bible prophecy, 1,260 years. And the people of God went through great tribulation. Some of them were cast in fires. Others was, were literally sown into two, into pieces. Others were thrown in arenas where there were lions and you know they were thrown there and it, it was like a spot. People literally witnessed the killing of masses of God's people. Why? Because of their faith. Because they did not believe or, or agree or abide with the teachings of the Catholic Church at the time. And therefore, there was a great persecution for the children of God. But God says, actually millions lost their lives. Mm. But God says that for the elect sake, Amen. those days were shortened. And indeed, the period lasted between 538 BC to 1798 BC when Napoleon actually took captive the Pope. Mm. And the awakening, the Protestant um, the Protestant awakening, or rather reformation, brought to a halt those difficult days. But again, God proceeds on and says, he wants his people. He tells his people, you know what? There will be false Christs mm. and false prophets that shall arise to show you mm. wonders and signs to seduce, if it were possible, even the very elect. Now, I want to bring us very close to what will be relevant to us. In the book of uh, Daniel chapter 12 we are told there will again in these last days be a great time of trouble such as ne there has never been and guys when probation closes and the spirit of God is withdrawn from the earth the men on this earth who have no knowledge, do not regard the knowledge of God, will arise against the sons and daughters of God. And they will persecute them for living for the truth, mm. for standing in for the Sabbath, and not abiding with the ways, in the ways of this world. And look, reading in the book Great Controversy, Ellen G. White says, you know, normally, or rather ordinarily, we have been in places where we have anticipated that the crisis will be greater mm. yeah, than it really was. But for this one, mm. unfortunately, no reasonable amount of preparation will make you ready for that time. You know, it reminds me of the days of Noah. Mm. Uh, in a book called Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen G. White says, he feared for his own existence. Mm. I mean, the devil feared for his own existence. Mm. But we are told this is a time of trouble such as, I mean, it has never been. And guys, the only hope for you and I, my brother, my sister, is our faith anchored in Jesus Christ. We need to entertain, we need to nurture a faith mm. that cannot be shaken mm come what me, that will be able to endure delay, hunger, and exhaustion. You know, some of us, when something very small happens to us, mm -hmm. we are quick to give up. We are quick to go to witch doctors. Mm -hmm. We are quick to stop coming to church because mm -hmm. we have been gossiped. But look, the faith that will make the saints endure the time of trouble ahead of us. Mm -hmm will be a faith that has trained itself to lean on God because all the forces of darkness will be against the, mm. the, the people of God. We are told that even the very elect yeah. 
will be deceived, now, may be deceived if not anchored in Christ. Now, there is hope for you and there is hope for me. Christ has already forewarned us mm -hmm. that false prophets will come, that false Jesus will come. And actually, I would recommend to you a book called Great Controversy. The greatest of all deception will be when the devil himself comes to masquerade as Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. And he will even perform miracles. He will heal people. But the question you will have to ask yourself, because even the very elect, mm. some of them will be deceived, is do you have the scriptures mm. indeed hidden within your heart that you may not be deceived? What is the quality of your faith? For the quality of your faith is what will make you stand. Do you know the word of God? Mm. Do you know the signs of a true prophet? Do you know the signs of the imminent return mm. of Christ? So that when you're told he's there in Philistine, mm. he has been seen. He has been seen in Kenya. He has been seen in Luyaland. Yeah? Jehovah wa Jesus and Wanyonyi. You will stand and say, I know what the Bible says. That mm. when he appears, every eye shall see him. Mm. You know, I pray, my brother, my sister, that when that time comes, you and I will be shielded under the shelter of God. Yes. And then again, we will not be deceived. For our faith will not only be intellectual, but also very personal and spiritual in Christ. Amen. Mm. Ah, Seraphine, that is very, very powerful. Sire. Then the Son of Man shall come. And that's what uh, Mark chapter 14 uh, from 24 to 27. And our, our key text for today is 26 that says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So take us through the Son of Man because there has to be hope at the end of all this. You know, when we hear what we're talking about, the tribulation, there must be an end to it and the hope that comes with that end. Thank you. Um, just on, on the light note, is uh, I'm Louis, and so we are waiting for the next uh, claimed God. We've produced everything from Jesus to Jehovah. Um, our name is Seventh Day Adventist. Okay, mm -hmm. um, the church. The A part of our name means we are waiting and looking forward to the imminent um, soon return. Um, of Jesus, that's that's a um, it's a vivifying, it's a changing hope, and Jesus does devote an amount of time. And in in Mark thirteen, when you read from verses twenty four to thirty two, he speaks specifically to the question of his return, and in those verses, he indicates that there'll be signs in the moon and in the, in the stars, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be wars, there'll be There'll be signs, it'll be visible. He won't show up um, secretly as it were. It seems uh, teaching about the signs of his coming had an impact on the immediate disciples who had it, like mm -hmm. Peter, and those who later on came to become apostles like Paul because they flesh out some more the theme about Christ's return. And one popular verse or series of verses is, First Thessalonians chapter 4, when you read from verses 13 through to 18, Paul fills out some of the details and he says, um, I do not want you to be ignorant, um, brothers, concerning um, those who have fallen asleep, um, lest you mourn, lest your sorrow um, be like those who have not or have not believed or who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Amen. For um, this we do know, um, that by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Um, but the Lord himself will descend from heaven mm -hmm. with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first then, we who are alive and um, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them um, to the clouds, 
and meet the Lord in the air, and then we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, Jesus in Mark has explained that, hey, his coming will be with, uh, um, with um, the signs in the stars, signs in the moon, signs in the sun. Paul, in describing now a bit more the granular detail, says um, there will be those who will be alive at the coming of Jesus. And I like this. He says he'll come with a shout and with a sound and with the sound of the trumpet. And he'll come with a host of the angels and will be caught up with him. Um, Peter speaks to the same. He borrows the same motif in explaining the return of Jesus in Second Peter chapter 3. He devotes verses 3 to 13. And in, in his language, he says that heavens will melt with fervent heat and the, um, will be scrolled away like a scroll. That's, that's very graphic, you know, when you, when you think about it. It's nothing hidden. So there's, there's a lot of sights, there's a lot of sounds. And um, um, as a biologist, I would imagine there's a lot of smell. There's, it's, it's very sensual in the sense all the senses will be involved. Um, Paul hinges something very important here. He says in he devotes the 58 verses of First Corinthians, the entire chapter, to the implications. Um, he says, if Christ has not resurrected, uh, we, are, we, are, we are lost. And then our preaching is in vain. We are most miserable if Christ has not resurrected. But then he says, we know Christ has resurrected. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it means we have hope. And he then proceeds later on in the chapter to explain how Christ will return. So putting these four streams of thought together, the teaching um, of Jesus in Mark 14, the um, fleshing out of the details by Paul in, um, Thess in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, the um, commentary of Peter in 2 Peter 3, and the implications are put together in, in 1 Corinthians 15, mm -hmm. what comes out clear is that the second return of Jesus will be visible, It'll not be it'll not be a secret um, event. So first of all, it is very visible. The number two, it is very personal. It's not some mystic return. It's a very personal. Paul speaks about it in language of um, then we will be caught up to meet with the Lord. Jesus says then they will see the sign of the Son of Man in the air. So it's not some mystic return. It's a very visible, very physical um, thing. So. It's very visible, it's very personal, it's very audible. Um, and the elements melting with fervent heat is not a very, it's not harsh, harsh. It's very, so it's, Christ is making a grand return um, to, um, to this. And just tailing off from what um, Seraphim has said, if the suffering we will go through is very public, it is only fitting that the final redemption and mm -hmm. exoneration of it would be also very public. Mm -hmm. There's a, what would appear as a troublesome word in Jesus' narrative is a word called this generation. Mm. Uh, um, and of course, it couldn't, um, this generation, Christ says, will see, um, will, will not pass away before they see these things. There are possible solutions to that particular conundrum or challenge. One is... Uh, one, one, one solution is to say a generation could mean a group of people. So it would probably mean, hey, the Jews or the Jewish um, generation or the Jewish race would be there when Jesus would be coming. That would be one way of solving it. A second way would be saying the generation of a group or category of individuals would be seeing all these end time signs um, will be there when Jesus comes a second time. That would be a second solution. But then a third one is when you split the text carefully, when you look at how Jesus is explaining things, um, when you read Mark 13, you realize in the, um, in the first section of, of Mark, when he speaks about this generation, he's speaking about the individuals who would be seeing um, the destruction um, of Jerusalem. And then after that, when he speaks about that generation, he's speaking about individuals who would be seeing um, the second coming of Jesus. So in a sense, what Jesus is doing in Mark 13 um, is he's speaking to two events and putting them together. One is the events leading to the destruction of Jerusalem, which he refers to as this generation, and then the events that will be there leading to the second coming of Jesus, which is he 
tends to overwhelmingly use the word of that generation. So those are three ways to deal with that, um, albeit troubling passage of saying this generation will not, pa will, not, um, will not pass away before they see the Son of Man coming. However, the central hope we want to always take with us is this, that Christ is assuredly coming. It's a mm. hope that um, um, transformed the way Paul lived, the way Peter preached, the way the disciples went through. Um, there are many details about the gospel that are not fleshed out, but the second coming as a concept is very well fleshed out and confirmed in various ways. Mm. But also that this hope is not standing um, in midair. This hope is firmly assured because of the arguments around the resurrection that since the same God who was able to resurrect Christ is also going and is able to resurrect us. The mm -hmm. same God who took Christ to be with him and to be our intercessor on our behalf is also going to bring um, Christ. The same Christ is also going to return and to take us home. So the story doesn't end with persecution. The story ends with Christ coming triumphantly, visibly, mm -hmm. personally, audibly, and when all this is said and done, we will be on the victorious side. Amen. Amen. And my dear panelists, as you think about uh, your closing remarks, I'd want us to think about what is the one thing that you're, what you're looking forward the most as an individual in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our viewers, as we come to the end of our, uh, of our lesson this morning, We've been told because we do not know the exact time of his coming, we are commanded then to watch. Are you watching? Blessed are those servants whom the Lord shall come and find watching. And that we find in Luke 12, 37. Will the Lord find you watching? Those who watch for the coming of the Lord are not doing so in idle expectations. Those are not the kind that are sitting and saying we will not work, we will not go to school, we will not do life because Christ is coming. That's not the watching that Jesus is looking at. Jesus is looking at a people who are saying that the expectation of Christ coming is to make men fear the Lord, fear his judgment upon transgression. It is to awaken them to the great sin of rejecting his offers of mercy. Those who are watching for the Lord are purifying their souls by obedience to the truth. With vigilant watching, they combine earnest working. What does that really mean? And I want to speak directly to somebody who is thinking that just because, because we've been accused of this as a church, that, you know, where you find the young people leaving university to go hide in some forest because then they think Jesus is coming and that's what they think watching is about. And, or, or you find families that no longer, you know, people leave jobs just because they think they're watching. The Lord is saying that in your earnest watching, he's expecting us to be earnestly working, working in his vineyard, but also working in the day-to-day -day life. And so my brother, my sister, the Lord is looking out to us and saying that he, he desires that we be found watching, but watching even as we are working. Your closing remarks, my dear panelists, I want to start with you, Elder Jared. What are you looking for most in the coming of the Lord Jesus? Please allow me to sing this chorus. Sing it. <clears throat> what a day that will be mm -hmm. when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Amen. 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 Ramona. I look forward to meet my beloved who have rested, my beloved who died. I, I look forward to that great get together. That's all I look forward towards the second coming of Christ. And so as I look towards that, I want to make sure that I stay in the Lord. I watch and wait and not in idle talk, you know, even in my actions. My prayer is that they too will join me in heaven. Amen. Mm. Seraphine. 
I'm reminded of the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 18, that says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time mm. are not worthy to be compared with the glory mm. which shall be revealed in us. And I like the rendition in the book, uh, the message version that says, The sufferings of the saints are but for a time, mm. but their glory is eternal. And for me, I look forward to that day when it shall be worth it that we went through all that we did. And that's the second coming. Amen. Elder Chief. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think uh, if, if I'm to look at what I'm looking forward to, I think there are so many things. I just look forward to seeing myself there. Because mm. you see, it's, it, it's so easy to... It's so easy to prepare people and fail to make it. Mm. The destruction of Jerusalem, the story is told of a man who went around the city for seven years warning people, oh. and he was destroyed in the scourge for which he warned people. Oh. And, and so I'm thinking at times, uh, we may become the best Seventh-day Adventists, the best Christians, and then we fail to make it, mm. having really been the best and helped others to be the best. So I, I, I think this sobers me up. So what is recorded in uh, the last part, it says, let's come in quickly, you find you asleep. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So I'm, 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 I'm really focusing on that and uh, looking forward to seeing myself join you who is watching and the others who are watching on that great day. Thank you. Amen. And Sire. Um, I'm looking I'm looking forward to three things. One is I'm looking to reunite with many dear ones whom I have lost over the years. I mm. genuinely uh, want to be with them. One. Number two, there is a promise of our faculties ever increasing, ever learning, ever growing. I'm really looking forward to that. But supremely, I'm looking forward to see Jesus in the, and have honest one-on-one -on -one conversations with him. Um, I'm reminded and consoled of the verses in Second Peter 3 um, from verse 13. It says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look forward for new heavens and a new earth where dwells righteousness. Therefore, beloved, since that, seeing that we look forward to such things, let us be diligent that we may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. The motivation for heaven doesn't make me do less with this world that I have, but the motivation for heaven gives me a secure locus of action so that I can do more with this world that I have, even as I look forward to the world that is to come. Amen. 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 My brothers and sisters, this morning, may the Lord remind us from the song that says, Oh, brother, be faithful. That's in our SDA hymnals. I think song number 402, if I'm not wrong. It says, the last stanza says, Oh, brother, be faithful. Eternity's ears shall tell of your faithfulness now. When bright smiles of gladness shall scatter thy tears, a coronet gleam by, on thy brow. Oh, brother, be faithful. The promise is sure that waits for the faithful and tried to reign with the ransomed, immortal, and pure, and even with Jesus to abide. May that be our promise. May that be our promise in Jesus' name. We've come to the end of our lesson this morning. Next week, we're looking at taken and tried. Let's see what's happening to Jesus at, as he's at, on the very last two words. It's called the Passion Week. To the very end, as he goes to the cross for you and me. The suffering that he went through, as, as Seraphim was talking about the great tribulation, maybe we can never understand what Jesus had to go through for us. Let's see you there. May the Lord bless you, bless your families. We'll see you next week. In Jesus' name, shall we pray. Father, this was a powerful lesson reminding us that they still hope, as long as there's breath of life, there's hope in, in, in each and every one of your children to trust in you, to walk in your ways, for you are ready to give them the power and the strength they need to endure to the very end. And he that endures to the end, he shall be saved. May we be among the saved and the redeemed. 
This is our prayer and our, as we pray for the members of the church who shall watch this program, that Lord, they will be blessed even in the waiting. It is our humble prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.